Welcome to Sports Night Live presents The Cage. I'm so excited about today's show. We've got lots and lots to cover. We're going to talk all about Super Fight League today, uh, one of my favorite up-and-coming promotions. With me, as always, is Mr. 48, Brad Wharton. Brad, nice to see you. Good to be back, as always. We've also got Neil Grove, who's got a fight coming up on Super Fight League as well. Hey, Neil, Brad. great to see you. Um, later in the show, we're going to be joined by Ken Pavia. We're going to be joined by Ruby Planson. We've got all sorts of stuff planned today, so I'm really, really excited about what we're doing. Um, so, Brad, big weekend last weekend, eh? Yeah, we not had, by the tone. We had Bama. We had, uh, I was over in Geneva at Strength and Honor. Um, lots and lots of really good stuff to talk about. What were your thoughts on Bama? Um, good card, uh, by all accounts. Uh, some decent fights. Obviously, the main event uh, really lived up to the expectations. Uh, great performance by Tom, and a valiant performance by Jack in defeat as well. Um, story of the night for me was Colin Fletcher, though. You know, we, we talked a lot about that guy. Um, he had another amazing entrance and, and another fantastic performance against uh, a ring general and Jason Ball, and showcased his stand-up. You know, he's known for his crazy submissions, but the guy's obviously got some uh, great Muay Thai as well. So Absolutely, definitely yeah. one to watch there. Definitely. And we had uh, Mr. Golden Arches himself, Louis R. Barnes. Fantastic performance by him as well. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, he had the late change of opponent. Um, I don't think many people were backing Leroy against Matt Ewan at all. Uh, yeah. Incredibly experienced fighter and. Leroy with a great submission in the second round. Yeah, really, really good. I thought the, the Bama card top to bottom was really, really good. Um, I'll be looking forward to watching that back on television. I think it's on uh, this coming weekend as well, so it'll be really interesting. Yeah, Saturday on Extreme Sports. Yeah, so that'd be really, really good. Um, I was in Geneva this week at the uh, first time I've ever worked this show called Strength and Honor Championship. Amazing, amazing event. It was at the Geneva Arena. Um, sold out, I think they had about 6,000 people there. Uh, it, it was just, again, top to bottom was just an amazing show. Um, we had uh, Goran Relic and Rogent Laurent was the main event. Um, Goran turned it a, an outstanding performance, TKO in three minutes in the first round. Uh, also had uh, Rustamar Hisroff beat Olivier Pasteur for the featherweight championship. Um, you know, European MMA is, is really, really coming on, and you see shows like this, shows like, you know, Cage Warriors has done all sorts of good things for European MMA, and, and I think that the stuff that's going on in the mainland is really, really exciting. Yeah, you know, I grew up in Europe, and it used to be the way that MMA was kind of a footnote on kickboxing shows. You maybe get two or three fights scattered in here and there, but now we're seeing, you know, even as far afield as Geneva, like you say, big MMA cards and 6,000 people. That's incredible. Yeah, exactly, and they announced their uh, their next event is in September in Moscow, so I'm Fantastic. really looking forward to that. I've not been to Moscow before, so it's there you go, really, really good. Neil Goliath Grove, my old friend. <laughs> really, really glad you're here. Um, you've got a big one coming up. Again, Super Fight League, I can't say enough <coughs> about that promotion. Um, you've got to be absolutely thrilled to be going over to India, fighting on that show. Um, give us your thoughts on, on sort of the whole thing. It's, uh, it's always great to be a part of a new show, a, you know, a big show like Super Fight League. Um, you know, there's a billion people in India, and if you can tap into 10% of them, you can have... You know, a lot of followers, a lot of fans, and uh, it's a growing sport there as well. And to be a part of the show in its infant stages, uh, it's nice because people remember you like people remember the first fighters in the UFC or in Pride, you know, so uh, yeah. it'd be nice to be a part of it. You, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I was having that discussion, in fact, with, with my wife, of all things, yesterday. And we were talking about, you know, sort of the, the days of old with the UFC when you know, when Chuck Liddell was coming up and, and Tito and all these guys were, I mean, they were huge monster superstars. Mm. Um, and, and there was, you know, sort of a cult following as the UFC was sort of gaining ground. And I think Super Fight League is doing that exactly with uh, bringing guys like you over, um, you know, bringing big names, big entertainment value, big fight value, and introducing it to a, a, a culture that's really not... Um, not familiar with MMA. So, so I think that the things that they're doing around that is, is absolutely spot on. And we're going to talk to Ken Pavian a little bit on the digital wall. Um, and we'll get his thoughts on, on this as well. But, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, an education, isn't it, for, for the Indian culture? Yeah, it is. I mean, and it's, it's good, uh, not just myself and Todd Duffy, but Paul Kelly is fighting on there, Shlomenko is fighting on there. There's a couple of really, really big names, uh, people we, we know from fighting in, in America. And uh, showing off... Uh, an array of, of different styles in fighting, and uh, to bring that across to India is going to be is going to be fun. So. Yeah, I'd say yeah. Well, and, and there, I guess the whole vibe of the show as well. I mean, it's it, it is a big production, and, and um, what's what's not lost on Super Fight League, and, and I think what really draws me to that promotion is is it's a show. You know, I mean, it, it's a show like Pride was a show. You know, it, it's it's all about. Uh, when we had Lenny on the other week, she was talking about the ceremony around the fighters, the yeah. ceremony around the event. 
and I mean, Super Finally's got it in, in droves, and they've, they've got their theme song, and, and you know, that's... <laughs> what, <laughs> what a theme song it is as well. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you what, um, I was watching the trailers this morning, because they had sent me the trailers, so we're going to show them in a little while, um, and, and that song has just been ringing in my head all morning long. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, really, you know, talking about when the UFC was developing, and, you know, late 90s, they really tapped into that Generation X kind of psyche that was going on in America at the time. Mm -hmm. Guys like Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, the, the bad boy personas, um, it really fed into the culture of America at that time. And I think that's what Super Fight League's doing as well. They're selling like a Bollywood production, and it's all about knowing your market, really. And I think that's something that maybe MMA fans outside of India didn't appreciate with the first show. Um, but, you know, they're selling to, to an Indian market, which is very different than the international market. So I think they've really hit the nail on the head. And obviously with the second card, the level of the fights and the fighters has gone through the roof. So I, I yeah. can't wait. I think it's going to be a really awesome show. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. And, and I think I, I saw you tweeting earlier uh, in the week about trying to get some clothing from Super Fight League. I want one of those blazers. <laughs> those blazers are amazing. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Somebody hook me up, please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll see you next time in a, in a Super Absolutely. Fight League blazer. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, so... so I mean, again, I can't say enough nice things about what's going on w with that promotion. Yeah, you, you, you're you absolutely spot on there with, um, you know, the, the last uh, event they had. It was come for the concert, stay for the fights. And, and while MMA purists maybe, um, maybe don't necessarily get the, the vibe that they're trying to put across, but, I mean, they're trying to educate an audience. Yeah. Um, I, I worked with, with another fighter, uh, a guy called Dave Keeley, um, really tall guy, you know, similar in stature to you, and, and he was telling me about... Uh, an event he went to in Korea. And, and it was very much the same thing where, where he came over and, and they were building him as a persona. And you know, he said he was like a rock star walking around there. And, and I think that, that you're going to experience the same uh, in India. And I, I go to India quite a bit with my day job. Um, and they, they, it's, it's like um, 1920s Hollywood, you mm -hmm. know, when, the way they, they look at their Bollywood stars and the way they're, they're going to look at their Super yeah. Fight League stars. I'm, I'm really excited for you because it's. <laughs> I can't wait to, to talk to you again after you've had the experience. That's exactly the reason why I'm really excited about going to fight there, is uh, to be an you know, initial part of the beginning stages of a massive show. I mean, a lot of money has been pumped into it, and like you say, by having their Bollywood shows before, people stay and they watch the fights. Uh, it's a nice way of educating the general public. Uh, everybody watches the Bollywood over there, and uh, you know, nice to uh, get the MMA going as well. Yeah, yeah, really, really good. Um, so, I mean, obviously you've, you've been training and, and getting ready for this fight. Um, how are you preparing yourself? I mean, it's a long, long, long flight over there. It's a long flight every time I fly uh, to go and fight overseas, whether it's in America or in India, it doesn't really matter. It's now just a different time change uh, in the opposite direction. And uh, being a big guy, it does take a lot out of you. But then again, Todd Duffy is suffering the same, same thing as I am, so it's fair and square. Um, the, the heat is the only thing I'm going to be aware of. Uh, I've heard really good, nice, nice things from where uh, Super Fight League 2 is going to be held. And, um, yeah, just looking forward to meeting the people and uh, you know, showing off my abilities as, a, as an MMA fighter. Yeah, well, us too. I mean, that's the, definitely the, the top of my list of fights I'm looking forward to in the next month is, is watching you on Super Fight League. We're going to talk to Ken Pavia when we come back on our digital wall. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about Super Fight League. I, again, I'm, I'm so excited to be talking about these guys this week because I've been itching since their first show to just you know, blow it up and talk about what they're doing. So join us when we come back. We'll have Ken Pavia on the digital wall and talk more about Super Fight League. Welcome back to Sports Night Live presents The Cage. Today we're talking all about Super Fight League. Uh, the new promotion that's sprung up in India, all the things that, that they're bringing to MMA, and, and the way they're educating their fans. So before we continue, let's take a look at Super Fight League. Victory, but I gotta raise his hand, but I gotta take that chance, but I gotta be 
need of a journalist, but I gotta win, but I gotta win, but I gotta win. Super Wow. <laughs> I am so excited for this next event, I, I gotta tell you. Um, I, I, like I said, I've been watching that trailer since they sent it to me this morning. I've probably seen it 10 times and I still get chills every time it comes on. So I've got the tune on my iPod. <laughs> I genuinely do have the tune There you go, iPod. there you go. Um, so we're joined now on our digital wall with Ken Pavia, one of the brains behind Super Fight League. Ken, are you there? I'm here. How you doing, guys? Really good. Thanks for joining us. I know it's, it's super early there for you. and. Uh, in Huntington Beach, so really glad that you got up early and, and were able to come on the show. It's actually super late. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so we've been talking about Super Fight League. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking about um, sort of the process that, that you've got to go through to, to sort of educate a new market, a new audience, um, and the things that you're doing there. Uh, with Super Fight League, and, and we're so excited. We've got Neil in studio as well. Really, really looking forward to the next event. Um, how did you get involved with these with the guys at Super Fight League? Uh, Raj Kundra, who's a sort of a serial entrepreneur, uh, owns a cricket league team in in India, and he came to the United States with a vision of bringing MMA to India, and asked me for a meeting. And I, I drove down, and we had some immediate chemistry. Sat down and explained to me his vision of bringing the sport and the uh, to to combat society, and we, we hit, hit it off and, and started brainstorming, and three months later, we had our first event in India. So it was kind of a whirlwind, and uh, it's happened very fast, but um, it's, I'm glad it happened. And I think the Indian fans are also very happy that we, we brought the sport there as well. You put that event together in three months. Did I hear that right? Our, our first meeting was the end of December. Uh, we signed a contract first week in January. We had our first event in um, first week in March. So, yeah, in, in a little over two months. Uh, Raj is a man of action and a man of few words, and he put his money where his mouth is and, and, and brought the sport to India. That is, that is outstanding. I work a lot of events, and I, and I see a lot of what it takes to put together uh, just a, a, what I'll call a normal MMA event, well, MMA but event. something like what you've done at Super Fight League. Well done to, to do that in such short notice. In, in a little over two months, he sold the arena out. There, was no there were no tickets available at the gate. Uh, put a television deal in place, put our sponsors in place. It was really... The, the people of India are, are extreme, are, in our organization especially, are extremely hardworking and efficient. And, uh, it's been a pleasure to deal with them. And was that your first trip to India for that, that event? He, he brought me out in January, so it's been, it's been two, two trips now. And we're anticipating uh, seven more this year because we'll have seven events this year and 12 next year. 12 next year. That, like said, our, our plan is to do one a month next year. Uh, we're doing March, April, uh, of course, the show. And then we'll do one more in May. We're taking the summer off to work on an Indian reality show to introduce some Indian talent to the, uh, to the fan base. And then we come back for September, October, November, and December. Outstanding. I, I, I'm so excited with all the things that you guys Thanks are doing there. Doing there. Uh, we've got Neil Grove in studio as well. Um, really looking forward to Neil's fight. How, how involved do you get, Ken, with the matchmaking? I am the matchmaker, so pretty involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I, I handle the international fights and, uh, and the girl fights, so... Uh, I knew a little over half the card, and then we have Daniel Isaacs, who's our COO that handles the primarily the Indian the Indian aspect of the card, which is the other half. So when you're looking to bring American guys, British guys, European guys, when you're looking to bring international fighters to India, what are the sorts of things you're looking for? Name recognition, uh, track record, um, and not yet potential. Um, 
potential is something we'll be looking into when we're, we're a little more active. But in our first three events, we wanted guys that have achieved a, a high level of success outside, uh, of, in, in, somewhere in the sport outside the SFL. Uh, we're looking to, to introduce the sport to some different territories. So in our international talent, we're looking for guys that have fought like, like Neil has in many organizations throughout the world. On, I mean, Neil has a, a significant fan base here in the United States, having gone to the Bellator finals and having fought in the UFC. Um, you know, Neil finishes fights, all of his wins, uh, none of them have been by decision. That's the kind of fighter we're looking for. Um, he always brings it. He's, there's no such thing as a boring Neil Grove fight. So uh, Neil was a, was a core typical fighter that we look for, and uh, we're very happy to be able to land him. And he's, he's actually a friend, so he should be a favorite <laughs> to our main event. So I think the Neil fans will really like him. If you uh, don't know anything about Ken, there's one thing you need to know about him, and he never sleeps. Uh, the first time I met him, uh, I, I texted him, it must have been about 3 o'clock in the morning, and he actually replied right there and then. I thought to myself, what are you doing up? And he said to me, money never sleeps. So Ken never yeah. sleeps, and if there's anybody who works hard when it comes to MMA, in any, any field of MMA, Ken Pavia is the man. Yeah, no, I agree. I think we've, we've had some email communication as well, Ken, and, and you're always back to me in, in a second, and I, I wonder the same thing. What's he got, a secretary working for him? But no, <laughs> it's all you, isn't it? I set my alarm every about hour and a half or two hours all night long, like I have a baby, just to make sure I'm checking on my clients and there's no emergencies. <laughs> and, and we are his babies, I promise you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh. and, and so we, we've heard uh, some mumbling, some rumors uh, about a guy called Fedor that may be darkening your door soon. And, and he said, Neil Grove be an exciting fight? That would be an outstanding fight. <laughs> I, I don't know. If I was Fedor, I wouldn't want to be touched in the chin by Neil Grove. But, um, you know, I, I think that there there aren't a lot of free agents that we wouldn't be, high-level free agents like that, that we wouldn't be interested in. You know, we've reached out to a number of them. Um, I, King Mo just recently became a free agent. He's something, somebody we've, we're very interested in. Fedor's out there, and, you know, we've reached out. I think there there's nobody that, that's not signed to the UFC or a major organization that we haven't pursued. We look to bring the, the highest level of, fighters to the SFL and into the international market through the SFL. So, um, yeah, we're interested, very interested. Ken, obviously the first show had um, quite a heavy Bollywood influence, and obviously that's, you know, what, what the guys over there are looking for. But what kind of feedback have you had from the Indian fans on, you know, the MMA itself? Well, the, the, the actual show hasn't aired in India yet. Um, the, the Indian fans were, were overwhelmingly positive about it. The, the Mumbai Times is the largest circulated American language newspaper, and we made the front page, not the sports page, but the front page twice the week of the event. Um, the, the event sold out. There were no seats available uh, the day of the event. Um, the, the press has been overwhelmingly supportive. But the, the event actually airs on Colors TV, which is 500 million homes um, in May. They decided to show all three events. They broke them up into two episodes. So there will be six shows um, starting in May. And that will be the true test of how the, the Indian uh, mass has, has accepted it. They were a little concerned because they'd never heard of MMA, they'd never really seen MMA, they were very novice to the sport, that, that they being a television station, and they wanted to make sure that nobody died or there was no uh, catastrophic uh, problems that occurred. And after the first three, our, our goal is to, to become a, a live event. So thus far, um, from, the, from the fan side, it's been ridiculously positive. Uh, we had YouTube traffic that we had anticipated, uh, much higher than we anticipated, uh, media, media acceptance, and of course, live gate acceptance. So uh, across the board, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but across the board, it's been very positive. And, and the guys in India, the, the promoters have just got to be absolutely thrilled with uh, the knowledge and expertise that you bring in and, and helping them sort of string it all together. Um, I, I think they're thrilled with, with the results, and it's been a team effort. You know, I, I, I bring a little bit of experience. I've been doing this for eight years uh, in some capacity, mostly in the managing capacity. But I think that we put together a team of 15 front office individuals that are very qualified and everybody's pulling their weight. Um, I, maybe it's just the work ethic in India, uh, because generally our, our front office is uh, is endemically Indian, but uh, everybody's been doing a great job. Not many people sleep and everybody's eager to please and it's been it's been successful. Well, really, really good. We wish you all the best of luck with everything that's going with Super Fight League. We'll, uh, we'll let you go catch your next one hour nap now. Um, <laughs> really, really appreciate you coming on, Ken. I'm so excited to see all of the things you're doing. You know, as I said earlier, I, I think a lot of promotions could learn a whole bunch from what you guys are doing at, at SFL because I think you're doing 
all the right things, introducing uh, th this fantastic sport to a new audience, and, and really, really well done. Let me ask you real quick, how does Neil Grove look? He's fighting in two weeks. Does he look fit? <laughs> Looks a bit chubby. No. <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, he's got a Big Mac and a beer in his hand. Yeah, you go. <laughs> no, Neil, Neil, Neil looks good. My, my money's on Neil for this fight all day, every day. Uh, while, we, while we're at this point, Ken, you're looking slim, man. You need to put some steaks in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just finished off a 10-day juice fast, so uh, I don't matter, and I, I've been drinking vegetable juices, and today's the first day I can eat. So. You look starved, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, thanks again. We'll, we'll let you go. So glad that you're able to join us, and we'll talk again soon. Great. Talk thanks, Ken. See ya. Cheers, Ken. Join us when we come back from the break. We'll be talking to Ruby Planton. We'll be talking a bit more about SFL and a bit more about the show in MMA. So join us right here on Sports Not Live presents The Cage. Welcome back to Sports Night Live presents The Cage. I'm joined in the studio now by my next guest, Ruby Planton. Um, Ruby has been around for, well, I guess the first time I saw you, Ruby, was uh, probably two and a half, two years ago, thereabouts. Um, so for those of you who don't know who Ruby is, let's take a look. Ruby, welcome to the cage. That was fantastic. Thank you. It's great to be here, and uh, good to see you as well. And you. Um, we, we've well, we've worked together on a couple shows. Yes, we have. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing that routine, or, or bits and pieces of that routine, live, set cage side. Um, in fact, Brad and I were talking, and, and he said that the first time he saw that show, uh, as you were spinning your sword near him, and he was sort of eating his pie at the break, was a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to have it. Depends my. I did get a nice haircut though. So. Yeah. Exactly. You should have um, asked me. I would have cut it for you. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, so, Ruby, you, you've been around, obviously, in the traditional martial arts scene uh, for quite a while. So let's talk about that first. Um, you, what, what's your traditional martial arts background? Well, I started at the age of seven, and I started learning a traditional martial arts called Korean Tang Soo Do. And I still study it to this day as well. I also started learning in traditional sword, um, Kenjutsu, sorry, <laughs> and the performance you see me do on stage is called Extreme Martial Arts and this includes aspects of dance, theatre, gymnastics in the way that we tumble in doing aerials, um, traditional martial arts with blocks and punches and even form of weaponry which you see me perform just earlier with my sword. And so I mean, what, what age were you when you first picked up a sword? I think I picked up the sword at about nine years old, eight years old. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was able to choose what weapon I'd like to study, and ever since I was little, I just loved playing with swords. I remember <laughs> you used to go into a store and you could get the plastic little swords, and I used to go in and I used to go to my mum and dad, oh, please, please, can I get one? So they'd always give me one. At even a young age, I was fiddling around with swords. Outstanding. So, so when I was nine years old, you know, my mom was saying, don't run with scissors. <laughs> yeah. Mom saying, quit swinging that sword at your brother. <laughs> <laughs> my mom won't let me play with a sword now. So. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that. Um, when I'm at home and I'm preparing lunch or anything like that, they go to me, oh, be careful with that knife. Don't worry, I'll cut it. <laughs> <laughs> I only sing, swing swords for a living. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you've been really busy also... Um, well, let's talk about your, your MMA influence as well. So I've seen you on a couple of MMA shows. I've seen you at Models Fight Night, um, where you, you've provided entertainment for the crowd, and it's been really well received. Um, how many of those type of shows do you do a year? 
To be honest, it can vary. Um, last year and this year, I've been very busy, especially with the MMA circuit. I've mm. been hired for quite a few shows. The most recent MMA show I've done is FCC yeah. for Adam, and I really enjoyed doing that show. It was a great experience and a good, really good atmosphere. Um, but generally, I love performing in MMA shows because I love performing in the cage in general. I find it, it's almost like a second home performing at an MMA show. Yeah, fantastic. And, and, and you mentioned FCC, Adam Tasha. We had Adam on a couple weeks. Let's take a look at FCC. Full contact contender, Adam's doing such good things. Absolutely. Um, young guy, we, we had him on a couple weeks ago, um, coming in. And, and you were doing a bit of uh, commentary on that show, weren't you, Brian? I was doing all sorts. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was interviewing the fighters beforehand, I was in the cage afterwards, did the commentary, and um, had a bit of a dance at the after party as well. So I provided some entertainment uh, <laughs> for everybody in, uh, in Berry. But yeah, it was, it was a cracking show. Uh, the main event w was an absolute war. Uh, Brett McDermott, former rugby star, against yeah. a guy called Mitchell Richards. And Mitchell actually broke his foot in the first round and came out for the second. So it was a very, very uh, valiant effort and a great war. And uh, Luke the Animal Taylor, former Wolfslayer guy, now training with Aaron Wilkinson at Daywalkers. Co-main event looked really, really good in his first fight, 205 pounds. So cannot wait for the next one. There's all sorts of rumours going around about uh, Luke Taylor versus Brett McDermott for the light heavyweight title. Rumours of a tournament later in the year. So yeah. really looking forward nice. to see what Adam does next time. Yeah, really good. And Ruby, you were in that promo as well. So you know, seeing you live in action. Um, so. When did you do your first MMA show, your first sort of entertainment MMA show? Um, to be honest, it's really hard to remember because I've been performing from such a young age. Mm. I'm, as I said earlier on, I started at the age of seven and my first show, I actually performed at the age of, I think, 11. So really? I've been doing it roughly about five years now. So How old are you now? I'm 16 you're now. You're 16 now. Unbelievable. 16 and, and you've, you're already so accomplished. Thank it's you. Amazing. And so outside, so are you, are you an MMA fan then? I mean, when you go yes. to shows, you watch the fights, you get into the fights? Yes. Well, um, at the FCC, me and my brother, who was actually with me, we was watching the fight and the main fight, the really big hench guy come on and he was roaring up and you expected him to win. And when the fight was going on, you could see that he was dropping his guard and me and my brother were shouting, lift your guard up. Yeah. <laughs> and we always get into the fights a lot and we cheer and we watch and we really enjoy it when we attend. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, well, I just can't get enough MMA in my life. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> and then you're doing some things outside of MMA. I mean, obviously, um, you're, you're highly skilled with what you're doing and, and that's certainly giving you other opportunities. I know uh, I saw some tweets and we had a, a bit of a conversation over the weekend. You were in France, so tell us what you're doing there. Yes, um, recently I've been flying to and from France to train for the Bercy show, which is 
the Festival of Martial Arts yeah. and it's held at the Bercy Arena and it's basically this huge, huge show um, that's in this huge arena that seats so many people and it's live on French TV as well and it's a fusion of all types of martial arts, all different styles and it's, and it's great to watch because it really opens your eyes to what styles there are out there and I was able to meet new people and I really enjoyed it. Um, what I was actually doing out there, in on the 28th of June, I am doing a, you could almost call it a theatre martial arts show. And what we done for the Festival of Martial Arts was almost a promo for it. And we performed about three to four minutes with me and the team of people. And as you can see, um, I was body painted. And yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. the theme behind it was I'm me and about seven <coughs> other people are gods and we are in command and there are other people who try to almost control us but we start a war with soldiers and we fight back and this is all done with choreographers and it's very very interesting to be a part of it and I'm just so looking forward to doing it. And so is, is that show going to happen in, in France specifically? Yes, it's yeah. going to be in France and it's called, oh, I hope I say it right, Dues es Mancha. I don't think I do the name justice, but um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my French isn't that good. So, but it's on the 28th of June. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I mean, I, I saw the pictures of you getting ready and, and of you getting painted up. And I mean, yeah. and we were talking earlier that you were kind of had to walk around all, all stiff bodied all day. Yes, it was, a, it was a long day. I was up from about seven o'clock, got to the arena about half 10 and had been rehearsing throughout the day at four o'clock I got body painted and I wasn't on till half ten at night. <laughs> so it was funny because I was the first person to be body painted, yet the last to be finished. And right. it was it was hard because I wasn't allowed to sit down in case the body paint come off, so I had to stand the whole time and I had a, a quite a bad backache <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> So you get a, a, a bit of a feel for what Lady Gaga goes through every day. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> uh, so Neil, traditional martial arts, swinging swords around, things like that, would you ever give that a go? Uh, well, I, I'm surprised you don't know that I have my black belt in Gojiru. Uh, so I come from a traditional, ba traditional martial arts background as well. Um, I, I initially, well, I started really late in life. It was in 2000 when I met my sensei and started doing karate. And uh, by 2005, I had my black belt and I had my first fight, as you know, in November 2006. I haven't stopped doing Gojiru. Uh, when I get a chance and when I get time, I still go back to the dojo and I train with sen Sensei Gavin Mahal. Oh, do you really? Oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and I feel like once you've achieved your black belt, that's actually when you start learning. I think a lot of guys go out there, they try and get the black belt and then that's it for them. But um, the initial gradings up to your black belt is really just to to see whether you're willing to learn. Uh, and uh, I've learned more since I had my black, you know, got my black belt. And uh, I'm a avid fan of anybody who comes into MMA from a traditional martial arts background. Yeah. Um, great fighters like George St. Pierre. There's a couple of them. I'm not going to mention names, but there's a lot of fighters uh, who come from a traditional martial arts background and do pretty well because they, they know how to adapt. The uh, discipline is pretty good. So when it comes to learning, you know, uh, we've gone through hard graft and getting our black belts. So to learn how to wrestle all of a sudden or to box or to do anything else um, comes quite easy. Yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier this week and they were talking about that exactly because it's, it's a guy that I know I've been trying to get him to come to the fights and he's a bit resistant and he says, well, you know, the thing about, about cage fighting is a lot of those guys, you know, they, they know how to fight and they, they know how to do it, but, but they haven't put in the work that it takes to, to understand a martial art and they're just in the cage fighting. I, I think you just touched on that. And yeah. yeah, I think, look, it, it, what, it, what I find hard is sometimes you go into an MMA club and you train with them and there's no discipline. You know, when the, when the coach is telling them what's up next, they'll talk amongst the, themselves and stuff like that. You won't find that in the dojo. And I think uh, that's maybe what, what lacks in, in, yeah. in MMA clubs. Um, and then being respectful of others. You know, we, we learn how to control our punches in traditional martial arts. And I think when you're sparring in an MMA club, sometimes you find yourself fighting rather than, than learning something or, or, yeah. or getting ready for a fight. Um, I also train in Muay Thai, and to me it's a traditional martial arts as well. Sure. And uh, I've been doing that for six years now, and I think 
uh, it, it all comes together at the end of the day. Um, it's called mixed martial arts for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I think if you come from a, uh, a wrestling background, judo background, all of those are traditional. And if you can start mixing it up with all the other fighting arts, uh, you become a better fighter at the end of the day. Sure, yeah, we were talking about that with Tom Watson last week as well, weren't we? Yeah. About the, the wrestling, I mean, I, I grew up wrestling since I was six years old, and, and you're right, you get a different discipline or you get a different mindset when you go into train. I think it's interesting to see it all come full circle now. I mean, if you go back to you know, UFC 1, there was a guy doing Tang Soo Do, which you, know, you said you started with, um, and then there was a period sort of towards the late 90s where MMA was trying to be really distant from traditional martial arts, and then all of a sudden a few years ago, you've got Lyoto Machida, coming in as a karate guy and winning the light heavyweight championship. And I think people are now appreciating the styles more. Uh, and it's the guys who are having success now, guys like Anderson Silva, guys like Machida, guys like St. Pierre, they're bringing those traditional styles into the, you know, the MMA sphere, which is wrestling, BJJ and boxing. Uh, and, and they're making it work and they're standing out and, and they're winning titles. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so Ruby, you've done a bit of film work as well, haven't you, with, with your mixed martial arts and a bit of stunt work and, and I see you all over the place. Um, can we have a look at your sword? Yeah, sure. I'm just hide this is you, um, <laughs> this is my performance blade, so it's not actually sharp. I get people approach me with caution, like, like, oh, is is it sharp? Can I touch it? It it's not sharp because I've actually had the blade blunted for reasons when I do release my sword in case it ever does go wrong. God forbid it doesn't. <laughs> that I it's one hundred percent safe. When I'm going through customs and traveling to and from Paris or where, wherever I travel, everyone always seems to have problems with me actually having this, which is such a pain. But they think that it's a samurai sword, but it's actually not. If you want to... Yeah, I can. It's, it's... It's light. It's light, it is light. Very light, yes. But it's not, it's generally not sharp. <laughs> oh my. So I can imagine going through customs with this. I mean, I, I, I fly a lot, and uh, you know, I've got a laptop and an iPad, and, and you know, that, that's. But I don't carry swords. <laughs> I have enough trouble getting nail clippers through customs. So I don't know how you exactly, that. exactly. Um, so this isn't very sharp. So what we've got planned, Brad, is going to be a bit more difficult. You brought those carrots, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> apple will fit in his mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. You're brandishing that and looking hungry before. I'm just getting scared. Is it your stomach rumbling? <laughs> Think of those carrots. <laughs> That's really, really a, a, a nice piece of equipment. So, so do you also have sharpened swords and, and things that, you, that yes. you work with that aren't necessarily performed swords? Because I study in traditional martial arts, I do use a samurai sword, which is a lot heavier compared to this, and it is very sharp. So I never take that one through customs, though. I think I'd be <laughs> probably wrestled to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but I train with both swords daily, roughly three times a day. Oh, do you really? Yes. Yeah. So my training is quite intense. Yeah. I use my heavy sword, my samurai sword, for strengthening my arms and also just to sharpen up on techniques. Yeah. I think um, what you said earlier on about studying traditionally first is very relevant also to what I do because you get people who they see what I do and they like it and they go straight into studying XMA, which I believe you shouldn't really do. I think you should always start with a traditional background, learn the right techniques, mm. um, learn the discipline and the respect, and learn the correct moves that you actually do perform. Sure. And is that a hard transition when you're, when you're working with your normal heavy sword and then you pick that one up? Yeah, it is actually. When I'm doing my heavy sword, my arms, I can feel pul pulsating, I do things where I hold my sword out for about a minute each side to build my muscle strength and then I pick my performance sword up and it feels so light yeah. and I <laughs> and I feel like if I run through my routine it'll fly out my hand but yeah. I've practiced the routine that much I don't think that'll ever happen. Yeah, fantastic. Like I said, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of sitting cage side watching you on, on several occasions and, and every time I go to an event and I find out you're there I'm, I'm always thrilled because I know that, that everybody's going to be in for a treat. Um, so we're going to talk a bit more to you, Ruby, when we come back. Uh, now it's time for a break. Join us when we come back from the break on Sports Night Live presents The Cage. Welcome back to Sports Night Live presents The Cage. We've been chatting with Ruby Planton, 
talking a little bit about traditional martial arts, talking about what it takes to become a traditional martial artist as well with, uh, with Neil Groves. Um, so Ruby, I just want to sort of pick back up with you a bit. Um, like I said, I, I've, I've seen you all over the place. I know you've got some, some film work, some television work, some, some video work. Tell us a bit about some of the other stuff you're doing. Well, the 13th and 14th, oh no, sorry, the 12th and 13th of May, I'm doing the martial arts show live at NEC Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And I will be performing there on the Saturday and Sunday, uh, two shows a day. And I will also be doing an hour seminar, just teaching people some tips and tricks on how to basically stretch properly, like stretch the correct way, not prevent injury and things like that. And, and I know your, your routine when you get ready to do a show, um, your stretching routine is, is several hours long, isn't it? So I think I've, I've been to a show where you've, you've come and we've, we've not had appropriate time or we've, we've had to pull in time for you to, to do your stretching. Um, how important is that to your routine? To be honest, I think it's important to stretch before you do anything mm. active-wise to just, in general, prevent injury, just make sure that you're just limber. As, as, long, as, as long as I'm roughly limber and I feel that I'm comfortable and able to do the moves correctly, I think it goes well from there. Yeah. And, and so I've seen, I've seen pictures of you as well. I know you used to do splits and now you're kind of bringing your leg even further. But how long does it take you to, to stretch and get ready to do that? Roughly probably about um, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Yeah. I find the more frequently I stretch, the less time it takes me to get flexible now. Mm. What many people don't know about me is that I'm not naturally flexible my flexibility is something that I have to work for, so I train it three times a day. I see. And is, is two shows a day when you're performing, is that, is that taxing on you? Is that a lot of shows? Well, when I perform, even though it is a minute and a half to two minutes long, everything I have goes into that performance, physically and mentally. Yeah. It takes a lot out of me, so I think two shows a day would be sufficient. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, we've got, joining us now on our digital wall, we've got Nathan Highland, uh, writer for mmpundit.co.uk. Nathan, are you there? I'm there, thank you for having me on. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Good to see you, Nathan. So, let's talk about Bama a little bit. You were at Bama at the weekend. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't there, but i um, just caught up with it. Um, some very good wins, though, on the card. Obviously, some fighters going places. Um, home support, on my behalf, went to Dale Hardiman. I'm sure he's going to be going places next after the unanimous decision. Um, some good wins for Fletcher, Barnes and Barnett, and of course Tom Watson. And and so, what was the absolute highlight for you of the evening? Um, obviously, seeing Dale win, um, being a homeboy that yeah. he is. I come from the same town. Um, but Tom Watson's performance, you know, after after all, over a year out, I believe, you know, to finish it in two rounds, it was really impressive. Yeah, I, I agree. And we had Tom on last week, um, and and I think that, I mean, again, he's doing all the right things. He, he's really he's really improving consistently and you, you see guys and they get to a level and, and you think boy you know he's 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 doing really well um and yeah. then you see him come out again and he's even better and then the next time he's even better that's right um I, what was it now he's won the last of the 11 last 11 of his 12 he has um which begs the question now what what is next for tom is he gonna go stateside you reckon the big room is obviously strike force i mean do, do you see him slotting into that division do you see him maybe going straight to the ufc or is that going to be too much of a test for him um, personally, myself, I think UFC might be a bit too early for him. I mean, we've had we've had um, a lot of English fighters in the past go go out there, get two two or three wins, and then they seem to burn out. They do with the pressure. But, um, like you said, strike force still with Zufa. Like you say, um, it's a good stepping stone. It is. It's a good start for him. I mean, even, even Bellator, you know, give that a go. Um, tournament format. But I mean, yeah, I'm, I could see him matching up with Luke Rockholt quite well. There's a number of good fights. I mean, you've got Jacare as well. Um, yeah. Keith Jardine still knocking around in the strike force. I believe <laughs> yeah, that might be right. a great first test for him. It'd make for a great fight anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. Well, it will. guys like that, especially Jardine. You know, every, every one of these fighters, there's only one place to go for these lads, and that is to the UFC. So, to put him in at strike force and see where he goes from there, I'd say. I mean, I think one option that you know Tom's going to be looking at uh, in terms of England is maybe Jimmy Wallhead. 
Um, yeah. For me, if, if I'm Tom's manager, I'm probably going to be staying him away from that fight. Um, <laughs> you know, not 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 because of you know who I think would win or who I think would lose. No. Purely because it's it's a case of it's a fight against a welterweight, and mm -hmm. if Tom is on the cusp of signing to the UFC, does he want to take that big of a risk potentially losing to uh, you know I'll be a very good welterweight and Jimmy's still a welterweight and that's yeah. not yes, going to do his UFC true. prospects any good. But I think if he's going to stay in England, that's the money fight for him. Yeah, surely it, it would be. I mean, it'd be a money for it'd be a winner for everyone if he stayed in England, obviously with the promotion as well. Um, but uh, you could have that show stateside, and I'm sure that would gain a lot more interest from the domestic scene over here. All the people this side, they would surely like to see Woolhead Watson, say, like I said, for Bellator, if he if he went there. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a good point. I'm a fan of both fighters, and I think it would it'd be a bad move. As a fighter, I'm telling you guys, I think it's a bad move for, for either of them to fight each other because Jimmy Warhead, like you say, is a welterweight. Tom is middleweight. And they both want to climb now. They've c come to a point now where I think they want to go fight abroad. They want to fight in the big, big arenas in America. And their managers should just steer clear from each other because I think uh, you know, whoever loses is not going to America. That's just how mm. it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if 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 both are eyeing the UFC or Strike Force, they're not going to make it. Not both of them. No. So uh, you know, Bellator is, is great with the tournament format. Jimmy Ward has, has done it already. I think uh, he, he's looking at at other avenues now as well. I don't know yeah. if Tom would take take on Bellator or not. But the only thing with with Bellator, I mean, I love Bellator and I'll fight for them until I die. Uh, is the fact that uh, is that your phone? Yeah, you excuse me for <laughs> uh, is the fact that uh, once you sign up for them and you get to the finals, yeah, um, you're contracted with them for for a long time. Sure, I'm happy with my contract with them, but like I said, those guys, I think, uh, want that little bit extra. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So Nathan, we've been talking about uh, Super Fight League today. Obviously, we've got Neil Grove in the studio. We had Ken Pavia on the digital wall earlier, and, and we're talking about uh, the the potential of Fedor and Super Fight League. So, yeah. Fedor versus Neil Grove, what do you think? Ah, Grove all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's just saying that now. Yeah, well, you can't <laughs> hit him. <laughs> Big powerhouse that you are, sir. No problems. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think that, um, you know, just kind of coming back to Tom for a minute, I, th I think that, yeah, he, he's absolutely doing the right things. I think he's... Um, sort of just sort of at that tipping point where you know he, he's got some international attention he's got uh, opportunities now to, to potentially go take over America Neil great point um, you know it hadn't even hadn't even occurred to me about him and Wallhead um, but yeah I think there's lots and lots of good things so Nathan we're about out of time we're gonna let you go uh, no worries. where can we find your website where can we find your writings um, mmapundit.co.uk you can also find me on Twitter uh, just search my name, Nathan Hine, and you soon find me. I'll pop up. Um, thanks a lot for having me, guys. Very good. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate Cheers, you coming man. on. Take care. Cheers, See you soon. Speak to you soon. Guys like that are, are well, kind of like Brad and the reason we keep him around. <laughs> <laughs> just walking encyclopedias, and, yeah. and I love talking with guys like that that just sort of know the game inside and out. Um, you know, have, have really interesting insight and interesting input into what's going on. Um, so back to you, Neil. I know we've been talking about Super Fight League. Let's plug your fight one more time. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, next weekend fighting Todd Duffy. Uh, looking forward to the fight. You know, I've trained really hard for it, and uh, he's a young gun who's obviously trying to make his way back up the, the MMA ladder, and um, I'm going to be the full stop for him for this one, unfortunately. Yeah, um, fantastic. I'm also, you know, also going to the MMA show live. I'll yeah. be there on the 12th and 13th, and then I'm doing the Seni show as well fantastic so, so we'll look forward to all of that can't wait to see you fight on super fight league i'm 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 glued to the set so <laughs> really looking forward to it. that's it we're out of time I, I i can't believe it um you're our first second time guest so i don't have a gift for you but ruby as i do with all my gifts i've got a limited Aww. edition hollywood t-shirt thank ruby you Planson, welcome to the hollywood army <laughs> thank, thank you guys you. so much for joining us today thank you for neil grove for brad wharton and for ruby Planson, i'm brett hollywood freeman it's not go time, but it's time to go. Join us next week on Sports Night Live presents The Cage. <laughs>